In this video, we're going to show that not every regular um, polygon can be constructed using a straight edge and compass alone. Now, in order to do that, to solve this last um, unsolvable geometric construction, uh, we need to provide a little bit of context. So I want to tell us a little bit of history. So going back to the 19th century, the so-called prince of mathematics, Carl Gauss, was the first to consider the constructability of real numbers and its relationship to algebra, which is what this whole lecture 28 has been about in our lecture series. The relationship is due to the solutions to the cyclic tonic equation x to the n minus 1 equals 0. This is an equation we have studied previously back in Math 40, uh, 4220 in, our, in the previous lecture series, for which the solutions to this are in fact going to be the complex roots of unity, the complex um, nth roots of unity, I should say. Okay, those are the n roots of this thing. And so Gauss was the first to show that this equation is always solvable by radicals. The, the roots of unity are always solvable by radicals. Okay, he also showed that if n is a prime number and p minus 1 is not a power of 2, then the solutions involve radicals higher than degree 2. Okay, and the solutions of the cyclotonic polynomial and the complex numbers, they coincide with the roots of unity, already mentioned that. Um, and so now we introduce the, the idea of a Fermat prime. So a Fermat prime um, is a prime of the following form. It's 1 greater than a power of 2. Um, although you can argue that the power of 2 is itself a power of 2. I won't, I won't dive into that too much right now. But by the previous result he I was talking about right here, um, when it comes to these roots of unity, so say zeta is a root of unity, e to the 2 pi i over n, like so, zeta n is a root to the polynomial x to the n minus 1. Now, uh, it's, this is not the minimal polynomial. Uh, that gets a little bit more complicated. We'll talk about that some other time in this lecture series. But what one can prove is that if you take Q adjoin a primitive nth root of unity and look at this and look at this as a field extension over Q, then this is always equal to phi of n, where phi of n here is Euler's totient function. Uh, this counts the number of num uh, this counts the number of integers less than n, which are co-prime to n. When uh, when p is a prime number, this number is going to be p minus one. All right, and when you have when you have a when you have a prime power, of course, phi of p to the n. This looks like p to the n uh, minus p to the n minus one, like so. When your numbers are co-prime, a times b phi then becomes phi of A times phi of B. Again, this happens if the GCD of A and B equals one. And so using these two, these two observations, how to compute totient of a prime power and totient of co-prime numbers, you can compute the totient of any integer so long as you know how to factor that thing. Um, and so it comes down to the constructability of the regular n-gon comes down to this phi function. We, th because of this right here, if you can construct the regular n-gon, it means you can construct this complex number. Now this is a complex number, right? So we're thinking it, we're thinking of it, of course, as cosine of two pi over n plus i sine of two pi over n. And so this is a this is a point in the plane. So the the real part is the x coordinate, and the imaginary part is the y coordinate. If we can construct cosine of two pi over n, we can construct sine of two pi over the n. So it comes down to can we construct cosine of two pi over n? And now, as we were considering trisecting um, an angle, we discovered that there were some cosines that we couldn't do. Like we couldn't do cosine of twenty degrees. Um, is that a possibility coming on right here? So this um, this conversation of Fermat primes comes into play because a Fermat prime has the property that phi of p, so you take 2 to the 2k plus 1 here, um, since it's a prime, this is going to be 2 to the 2k, uh, like so. So for phi of a Fermat prime, it's a power of 2. All right. Now, this is true for any Fermat prime. Now, if the Fermat prime is repeated because of the property we mentioned earlier, you no longer get a power of two. You get a power of two times uh, something else. OK, now, if you take a power of two itself, two to the K, uh, this is going to be two to the K minus two to the K minus one. 
for which this then becomes two to the k minus one. You can simplify it in the following way. So the so if you take um, phi of two to a power, that's a power of two. Um, if you take phi of a Fermat prime, that's a power of two. Therefore, if you have a product of a power of two and any number of Fermat primes, which that could be no Fermat primes, then phi of that number will be a power of two. And those are the only integers so that their Euler totient is a power of two, okay? And so remember with the constructible numbers, with the constructible numbers here, um, if you have a constructible number alpha, if you look at the degree of Q adjoint alpha over Q, this is always equal to a power of two. But when it looks, when you look at the, uh, the complex roots of unity, you can only construct them with a degree phi of n in that situation. And therefore, if this is a power of two, this only happens in the situation where you have a product of twos times some number of distinct Fermat primes. Now, Gauss was made famous because he was the first one to discover that you could construct using a compass and a straight edge the regular 17 gone, um, which 17 is a Fermat prime. Notice the Fermat primes. You have three, which is two plus one. Um, you have the next one, five, which is four plus one. Notice here we're just taking a power of two plus one. Um, the next one, eight plus one, it's not prime. That's nine. Um, then you take 16 plus one. That's 17. That's a Fermat prime. Now, and so, so Gauss was able to prove that you could take, you could construct the regular seven gone. Now, the shapes that we can do, like a triangle, oh, triangle three is a Fermat prime. We can do that. Um, you can construct a square. Well, a square is two squared. That's a power of two. You can construct a pentagon because a pen, because five is a Fermat prime. You can construct a hexagon a regular hexagon here, because a hexagon six is two times three, that's two, a power of two times a Fermat prime, okay? Um, you could also construct 12, a 12-sided figure, a dodecagon, because 12 is four times three. Um, we could construct a 20-gon, because uh, 20 is four times five, like so. But 17, of course, was this really cool one that Gauss was able to produce. As legend goes, Gauss had requested that the regular 17 gone be, in, be engraven upon his tombstone uh, because he was so impressed by this result. Now, the engraver of the tombstone, again, as legend, refused to do so because he claimed that the engraving was too complicated um, to do. So you can look at Gauss's tombstone, Google the picture of it. You don't see the regular 17 gone there, and that's really too bad here. Uh, so re re returning to the mathematics here, uh, if we were to construct the regular n gone, we need to be able to basically, uh, we need phi of n to be a power of two, because this boils down to be able to be able to construct cosine of cosine of two pi over n. Which note here that cosine of two pi over n, this is the same thing as one half. Um, a, comp a primitive complex root of unity plus its conjugate, which is also the same thing as its inverse, right? So cosine of two pi over n, it belongs to this field, okay? And so that's why this degree does matter. And cosine of two pi over n, if you look at the, ex if you look at the degree of the extension, Q adjoined a primitive root, uh, a primitive nth root over Q adjoined cosine of two pi over n, this degree is, this is a degree two extension, because cosine of two pi over n is the root of this quadratic polynomial, x squared minus zeta plus zeta inverse x plus one, which is a polynomial over this field, okay? Um, for which case then, if you look at cos uh, q adjoined cosine of two pi over n as an extension over q, then the degree of that extension is phi of n over two. So the constructability comes down to is phi of n over two a power of two. And the conditions that Gauss had mentioned earlier are exactly that. Your number n needs to look like some power of two, and you have some products of distinct Fermat primes, which again, that product could be empty. Now, I should make mention that with, re with, with regard, um, at the recording of this video, there are only five known Fermat primes. We've already mentioned three of them, three, five, and 17. There's only five known. Um, Fermat actually conjectured that every number in that sequence was going to be a prime number. Um, he basically only computed the first four. Um, 
Uh, I think he could did the first four. Maybe he did all five of them. I don't think so. But he constructed the first four and then conjectured that they were always prime. The very next one was not prime. Whoops-a-daisy. Um, so Fairmont has a bad habit of getting things named after him, even though he never proves anything. Um, yeah, in this case, he, his conjecture was actually wrong. Um, Fairmont, pro, Fairmont numbers are not always Fairmont primes. There's five known Fairmont primes. And honestly, the current mathematical community believes there are no more Fairmont primes, that there are only five of them. But the proof has yet to be provided. Um, and so it's appropriate to end this conversation about impossibilities with yet an open theorem. How many regular ingons can you, can you construct? Because we don't know how many Fermat primes there are, so we actually don't know how many ingons we can construct. We know it has to have this factorization, but how many primes are there? How many Fermat primes? It's probably the five, but you know, um, someone hopefully one day will prove that result too.